Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWANTTOGARDEN.COM and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWANTTOGARDEN.COM. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have returning guest Lisa Steele to talk about her new book, Gardening with Chickens. Lisa is a fifth-generation chicken keeper, nationally recognized author, and the creative mind behind the Better Homes and Gardens award-winning blog, Fresh Eggs Daily. Lisa inspires both the newcomer as well as the seasoned chicken keeper and engages almost a million fans worldwide on her Facebook page of the same name with her easy, fun, and accessible approach to raising backyard flocks naturally. The author of three top-selling books, Lisa's writing can also be found in such publications as Chickens, Backyard Poultry, The Farmer's Almanac, and Hobby Farm, as well as at HGTVGardens.com. She's been featured in American Farmhouse Style, Down East, and Cottage Journal magazines, plus has appeared on numerous national radio and television programs, and is most recently hosting her own 30-minute chicken lifestyle television show called Fresh Eggs Daily with Lisa Steele, which airs on the local CW affiliate in Portland, Maine. Welcome to the show today, Lisa. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me back. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And it's been uh, quite a ride since uh, we chatted last from your updated bio, and you have much bigger reach now, uh, I've noticed, which is really great. Congratulations on that. Well, thank you. I'm just excited how many people are interested and continue to be interested in raising chickens. That's that's really exciting to me how this has just grown and keeps growing. Yeah. And it's, it seems to me that it's growing exponentially. All of a sudden, like in the past couple, three years, it's not just one or two people I'm hearing about growing chickens, but, you know, I'll be at the grocery store and somebody will tell me about their backyard chickens. And that'll happen again two days later. Are you finding the same thing? It's true. I think I think it's actually hard to find somebody who doesn't either already have chickens or know someone who has chickens, whether it be a neighbor or a family member. Mm-hmm. Or I think it's really hard to find somebody who doesn't have any concept of chickens living in people's backyards. Yeah. How cool is that? I love, love, love that. And you, you've been at this for a long time. Well, I have. I mean, as an adult, I've had chickens since 2009. Uh But of course, I grew up with them and, you know, had chickens as a kid. So it's kind of been a a lifelong thing. I did take a little bit of a break to go to college and and work for a little bit. But Uh and now you get to play with chickens every day. Right. Exactly. (laughs) So you have a new book out called Gardening with Chickens. It's by Voyager Press. Congratulations, by the way. The subtitle is Plans and Plants for you and your hens. How did this book come to be? Well, this is a book I had had an idea about for a couple of years, and it just kind of percolated for a while. 
I've actually been gardening for longer than I've been raising chickens. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until we got our chickens back in 2009, as I mentioned, that the whole gardening cycle kind of made sense. You know, you you, um, you kind of overlook sometimes that in addition to laying eggs, chickens also provide a ton of manure. Oh, yes. So you've got fertilizer for your garden. So, you know, once you start incorporating that into your whole your whole garden plan, and then obviously the chickens can eat bugs. You know, they, they love to munch on all the bugs that are eating your vegetables, and they can eat all of the stems and stalks and whatever you're not going to eat yourself. And, I mean, I started planting things for the chickens, and it just became this, like I, like I said, a full circle that really made a lot of sense. So I wanted to write the book for a while, and I finally, you know, presented the idea to Voyager Press, and they loved it. So mm-hmm. it came to be in November, and... Um, it's selling really well. People seem to be really excited about it. Nice. Well, congratulations. Thanks. So this book, it kind of represents a holistic view of keeping your garden and chickens together, kind of as a, let's say, a team. Is that the case? Right. Right. I think a lot of people um, miss a, an opportunity. You know, I get email all the time. You know, my chickens are out and they eat all my flowers, my landscaping. They kick all the mulch out of my flower beds. Mm-hmm. You know, they take dust baths in my gardens and whatever. So then they just pen up their chickens or they fence in their gardens or both. And I think when you do that, you're really missing it out on a huge opportunity because chickens were born to be garden helpers. <laughs> I mean, they love to scratch in the dirt. <laughs> they, I mean, they love it. They let you know, you get it out a trowel or a shovel. Uh-huh. And the chickens get all excited. So so really, they're doing what they love to do. They're scratching in the dirt. They're turning it over for you. They're pooping. They're fertilizing it. I mean, it's it's just a beautiful thing when you put it all together. Uh-huh. So I, I think people just, the book, I'm trying to get people to think that way and realize that their chickens can really be helpful and be free garden labor mm-hmm. if you let them. Yeah, if you let them. And you have to kind of set up for that, though, right? Well, yes, there's a lot of supervision involved because you can't just let them run, you know, willy nilly through your garden because mm-hmm. they'll eat everything. So right. you do have to supervise. I do a lot of things seasonally. So like after I've harvested everything in the fall, I let them have free range. Of course, then you want them to eat any bugs oh, yeah. that they find or any leftover, you know, you're tired of picking um, peas or zucchini or whatever. So I just let them eat all that. And same thing in the spring before you've planted. Mm-hmm. You know, they've, they've probably been cooped up for the winter. There's been snow on the ground. So they're excited to come out and, the, you know, get in the garden with you and help you turn the soil over and eat whatever they can find, any weed seeds and stuff. But during the planting season, obviously, you, you do have to uh, supervise because they, they all, they're they non-discriminatory. I mean, they'll <laughs> yeah. eat all your earthworms. They'll eat all your toads. I actually usually keep a bucket with me when I'm in the garden with the chickens. And if I see any toads, especially, I'll grab them and put them in the bucket until the chickens are gone because, oh, you know, I don't yeah. want them eating all my toads. Right. <laughs> right. Well, what, and why are the toads good in your garden? Oh, toads eat bugs. Oh. Toads eat lots of bugs. So you want to keep the toads and the earthworms. I mean, I don't like the chickens eating all the earthworms because they're super important for soil structure and all that. Yeah. You know, they build their tunnels. So you want the worms in your garden, too. So so I try to save any of the good bugs and then put them back. Garden critters. Mm-hmm. So as I look at the different chapters of this book, what I'm really seeing is this is a gardening book that integrates chickens into it which is a little bit different than having a chicken book around gardening. Does that make sense? Right. It does. And and the premise is that, and maybe I was incorrect, but the premise was that most of the people who would buy the book would already have chickens Uh and they would be interested in learning how to garden. I mean, I figure, you know, you already have the chickens. You're probably outside with them a lot. So you might as well plant a garden. I mean, if you're spending time outside anyway, Mm -hmm. you know, there are plenty of books on getting started with chickens. So this, it's not a, you know, getting started with chickens, beginner type chicken keeping book, because there are plenty of them out there. So what I really wanted to do was assume you already have chickens and you're looking for a way to either start gardening or, you know, save your garden and your landscape. Because it goes into landscaping, too. It's not all about just like vegetable gardens. I talk a lot about um, saving your landscaping from them and different ways to um, kind of have a nice looking yard and still have the chickens. Mm -hmm. Wow. Cool. So, one of one of the things that I'm I'm kind of wondering about is because I know what chickens will do to my garden, and you said when I go out to my garden, 
I'll take a bucket with me, and if there's any toads around, I, you know, I harvest them and hold on to them so the chickens don't get them. Do you actually let your chickens in the garden space while the things are growing, or is it only before and after? It, no, I do while well they're growing, too. I mean, obviously not when you have seedlings or really small plants. Uh -huh. But once the plants are bigger, you know, if they're a uh, foot, two feet tall, yeah. you know, you can let them in then, you know, before the, the fruit is ripened. Mm -hmm. But I definitely wouldn't put them in there and leave them in all afternoon because they will. You know, <laughs> I do like to keep an eye on them. I don't mind if they walk around and nibble a little bit of lettuce or whatever, you know, as they're eating the bugs. But, but while I have stuff growing in there, you know, I usually only bring like one or two chickens with me. And I, I do keep an eye on them and we limit the time. But I mean, they're really wonderful at, at kind of debugging your garden. Right. So, you know, I do like to, to give them a chance so, to do that. So do you have any specific tips or hacks on how to manage your chickens in your garden? Obviously, one of them is be there with them when your garden's growing. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Well, another thing you can do is build, they're called chicken channels, and they're basically kind of like half circles of chicken wire over like uh, wood or PVC, and uh -huh. you're basically, basically making a long tunnel. And Or you can just kind of make like a wooden frame, like a box with chicken wire around it. Right. Put your chickens down on the ground, plop the box over them. So now this keeps them in between the rows of, of your produce. And you can oh. kind of move that around your, your garden. So they can still, you know, scratch in the dirt and all that, but they can't actually get at your plants. And it also keeps them safe from hawks and things, which is nice. Uh-huh. Wow. So that's, that's another idea. I mean, yeah. it's not, not totally predator-proof, but... Right. You know, at least it keeps your garden safe. If you're if you're outside, but you're not right there with them, it's a nice way. And I mean, you can make them as as large as you want, as long as you want, so the chickens can like run up and down this tube, basically. Right. And right. and just be where you want them to be. Well, that that would very specifically put chicken manure between the rows, so that when they get watered. Exactly. Oh, nice. Right. <laughs> that is brilliant. That is brilliant. So you said while you were chatting there for a moment, predator proofing, we really need to talk about that. We live in Phoenix, Arizona here at the urban farm. And I'm basically, if you stood on my roof and looked 50 miles in each direction, there's city. And about 10 months ago, we lost our whole flock of 10 hens to a bobcat. Oh, yeah. And a, yeah. and a buddy of mine, a buddy of mine, right in the middle of the sixth biggest city in the country, and a buddy of mine eight weeks ago came out at two o'clock in the morning and there was a raccoon in his chicken coop, again, within about a mile of my house here. So these are, these are predators that you wouldn't normally think would live in, you know, a big city like this, but they're here. So what kind of tips do you have for us about predator proofing your coop? Well, that, that's a really good point. No matter where you live, there are going to be predators mm -hmm. in the in the urban areas. Sometimes even fox, you know, will come and just oh, yeah. be walking down the street in the town. You know, they, they do hunt by day. Fortunately, most predators come out at night. Right. So your coop should really be Fort Knox. I mean, locked up every night at dusk with the chickens inside, yep. you know, welded wire on the windows and, mm -hmm. and all that. I mean, I use blinking solar predator lights. Nothing is even coming near my coop at night. But during the day, things hunt too. I mean, fox do hunt by day. We've seen fisher cats here, which are basically like a, I guess they're like a badger on steroids kind uh -huh. of thing. <laughs> you know, oh, badger, uh, wow. Eagles, owl. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're nasty. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're, um, they, they've been known to attack kids also. So wow. they're nasty. But eagles, owls, hawks, you know, there's lots of things that do hunt. Your neighbor's dog. I think a lot of people don't oh, recognize yeah. that dogs are a huge threat to chickens. So, mm -hmm. so really penning them up. You know, ours are in a run that's covered all day long. Usually in the afternoon, I let them out when I'm going to the outside you know, if I am gardening or we're barbecuing or washing the car or whatever, I let them out then and right. keep an eye on them because mm -hmm. it just, you know, it just takes one predator one time. And like you said, you've lost one all, you know. It's, right. Yeah. And and with the bobcats, it was indiscriminate. They just killed them. It was, you know, I guess they it looked like they were playing with them and they just, you know, one disappeared. The other nine were dead. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, That's we, insane. Yeah. And I would assume a bobcat can probably scale a wall. Oh, like who knows oh, yeah. how tall i mean yeah 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 so what Crazy. we actually built a fort knox coop uh, Good. um 16 inches Good down with concrete and 
uh, welded wire on the top and hardware cloth on the sides. So it's really, mm -hmm. really, I can't say enough to everybody listening out there. If you have chickens, if you have hens, no matter where you're at, you have to make sure that you protect them. Right. Yeah. And just in a fenced in backyard is not protection because a bobcat or fox could be over that fence in no time. In no so, time. yeah, it, it's a shame because everything wants to eat chickens. But, yeah, you got to keep them safe. And, yeah. and you're right. You don't I mean, you would never imagine something like that would even happen. Right. Well, I've been keeping chickens here in Phoenix since 1999. And it took till wow. the summer of 2016 to have anything like this happen. You know, so that was that's crazy. What fifteen years and I, never a problem. In fact, my hens, I used to just have a. I didn't have a coop for them. I just had a roosting bar, so they roosted up at night and uh, cover mm -hmm. on three sides, so that you know if it was raining outside, they could get out of the rain. And that was how I did it for the first twelve years. So well, and I think with more, I mean, there's more population. The animals are getting more bold. They're having less place to live. Yeah, you know, less woods and stuff. So it, it's just it's all coming closer, and yeah. probably more chickens too. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, the more people that have chickens, the more meals there are for the predators. So oh. they figure it's worth it. Oh, I hadn't even yeah. thought about that, but that is so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so true. Mm -hmm. So you had sent me a copy of your book, Fresh Eggs Daily. Uh, about a year and a half ago when you were first on our on our podcast and I turned it over to my sweetie Heidi and it's tabbed up and you know she uses it <laughs> on a you know on a weekly basis and one of the things that I that I took note of that she does a lot is she uses your uh, you know your planting guides for what kind of plants to grow for your chickens to help improve their their health so, and it looks like you have a whole chapter, chapter number five, creative gardens for chicken keepers. Tell me about that. Okay. Yeah. And my first book I wrote in 2013. So it was a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. There, there wasn't a lot of information out there and there still really isn't, you know, scientific studies about the different herbs and mostly mm -hmm. herbs is why I concentrate on the culinary herbs, but you know, the benefits for chickens, nobody's really doing the studies. So I kind of went on common sense you know, the general benefit of the herbs, things like that, watching the chickens, watching which ones they liked to eat when they were in my herb garden, whatever. Mm -hmm. But just recently, I don't know if you've seen Purdue has a TV commercial where there's a guy standing in the chicken barn and he's holding some parsley and he says, Purdue chickens eat parsley and they're feeding their chickens parsley now. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, we, Purdue didn't just wake up one day and say, I think we're going to feed our chickens parsley. Right. I mean, clearly this is expensive. They've done studies. They know exactly how much to feed, why, the benefit of it. You know, I wish they would publish these studies for the general public, which obviously they haven't and probably never will. Right. But all I know is that Purdue is feeding their chickens parsley because there is a very definite benefit. Yeah. And they're going to all this expense to do it, which really makes me happy because that kind of reinforces you know, I've been feeding my chickens parsley for years. They right. love it. And now I know that there's a definite reason. Antibiotics, thyme and uh, oregano are actually proven natural antibiotics, uh -huh. which is wonderful for chickens. So little by little, there are some studies being done or, like I said, just, you know, commercial chicken farms using these things. Uh -huh. So I think that, you know, I don't know how much or when or how often, but I know that they are fresh and they're green and I can grow them inex inexpensively and the chickens love them right. and my chickens are super healthy. Yay. You know, so for me, it makes sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. One, one of the things that I've started doing, so I have a lawn here at the Urban Farm. A, a long story about why I have a lawn. I don't really agree with it, but it's here and it's impossible to get rid of. But one of the things that I've started doing is overseeding the lawn with parsley and different yeah. different herbs and different plants, clover and those kinds of stuff, so that when I do mow, the grass clippings go to the chickens, and they're not just getting grass, but they're getting these other things. That's awesome. Seems yeah. like an herb lawn. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, well, why not? Well, I have to tell you, though, uh, I tell people all the time, you need to go out and observe, because that's where you're going to learn the most about what's going on in your space is go observe right. what's what's happening there, right? So most recently, I tried this project in the backyard where I dug up the grass and I planted out a bunch of stuff and it became a jungle and it was just a mess and it didn't really work. And my intent was is that I was going to, you know, grow that for the chickens, grow fodder for the chickens. So I'm, this is like six, eight weeks ago, I'm standing in my neighbor's front yard talking to him and I look down and there's parsley 
growing under my feet in his lawn. <laughs> and it was like, don't, I just should just plant it in the lawn. So I, that's, a, that's a new project I've started here. So I, and it came from observing. Yep. That's really neat, and you have to let me know how that goes because that's a really great idea. I mean, we don't we don't treat our lawn with anything. When you have chickens and they're in the lawn, whether you have chickens or dogs or kids or whatever, right. you shouldn't put you know herbicides and pesticides in your lawn. But Amen. when you stop doing that, you obviously get a lot of weeds. So mm -hmm. we have you know chickweed, dandelion, mm -hmm. um, but the chickens love it, and, right. and the bees. You know, as yes. soon as that stuff flowers, you see the bees. Yeah. They love it. The clover. We have bunnies come and eat it. So you're right. When you watch not only the chickens but other wildlife, and you see what it is that they're eating and benefiting from i mean just a grass lawn is, is pretty ridiculous <laughs> i love the idea to make your lawn into like an herbal salad bar and not only for the chickens i'm sure that there are other animals that are enjoying those plants yeah oh yeah i love that an herbal salad bar <laughs> you, you come up with great words one of the loves one of the reasons i love having you on the show is because of your you know the things that you say uh, earlier, I wrote this one down. Born to be garden helpers. Chickens are born to be garden helpers. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Love that. So I'm still in chapter five of your book, and I'm seeing here something that says natural wormers and the natural wormer garden. Can you speak to that? Okay, yeah. So this is another area where there are not lots of studies done specifically on chickens, mm -hmm. on things that you can use as a natural wormer. Most um, animals can get internal parasites. You know, everyone who has cats and dogs is, is familiar with that, you know, tapeworm, roundworm, whatever. Chickens are no different. There are chemical wormers that you can give twice a year. Right. Not a big fan of that. So instead, I like to use some of the plants that are thought to be natural wormers. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who raise goats will use these. I guess goats are very susceptible to, like, lots of stuff. So a lot of the goat people are, like, super herbal. Right. So I've been reading a lot of what, what people do with the goats. So things like pumpkin seeds, in fact, the seeds of anything in the squash family, oh. you know, cucumbers and, and all kinds. But the bigger the plant, the better. So the pumpkin seeds are more, you know, they're bigger, so they have more of this coating that are supposed to paralyze internal parasites, and then the chickens can flush them out of their system. Mm -hmm. So other things, you know, cantaloupe, cucumber, anything in that, that squash melon family, dandelions, same thing. Feeding a lot of garlic to your chickens can help keep them free of worms. And also nasturtium, which I don't know if you grow them, but Wild. I love growing nasturtium. Oh, they're yeah. super easy. Yeah, they're super easy to grow. I mean, they, they, they trail and climb and they come in all different colors. The chickens love to eat them. Oh. So, you know, I figure even if this stuff doesn't work, it's all nutritious for the chickens. Right. They love to eat it. It's a pretty little garden. Mm -hmm. And I've actually had fecal samples done on my chickens manure. You know, our, your regular vet should be able to do it, your dog vet. Right. And they've always come back clean. You know, a healthy chicken can handle a normal worm load. But it's when, you know, the chicken gets sick or, or the worms just overtake their system, it becomes a problem. So, right. you know, I think all these things as preventives are just, a really good idea you know if you can if you can head off problems before they even start mm -hmm. it's so much easier oh yeah so well you're you're building their immune mm -hmm. system you're making a happy chicken and exactly happy chickens are gonna live longer and they're gonna lay longer exactly yeah. cool well I, you know your list squash seeds melon seeds that kind of stuff dandelions garlic and nasturtiums I actually have dandelions garlic and nasturtiums growing wild in my yard nice so it just comes back year after year and so you know harvesting some of this and giving it to the chickens is easy exactly yeah, they... i bet if you let them out i mean you notice what they go for right you know i i always watch my chickens when they're out and see what kind of plants they're going for and they're uh... eating on their own so i i know to pick them for them when they can't be out right when I know in, in your book, Fresh Eggs Daily, you have a recipe for chicken feed that includes garlic powder because once every month I make the, I make the mixture up that was in your book for our chickens and it includes, <laughs> it includes some garlic powder. Right. There is actually a commercial product that is made. It's garlic powder that's specifically made, you know, for birds, chickens, whatever, and it has the dosage um, amounts on it. I'm a big believer in that. I, I mix that same recipe up. Uh -huh. Go figure. Um, that's what my chickens eat. But I, you know, I add garlic powder, probiotics. I mean, there's a couple of things I add to their feed because, mm -hmm. again, just a lot of natural preventives. Garlic is hugely beneficial for everybody's immune system, yeah. whether you're, you know, people or, or animals. So I, I do mix the, the garlic powder in. I feed them fresh garlic also. I grow garlic, so, uh -huh. you know, they eat fresh garlic too. 
Nice, nice. You mentioned probiotics, really important. Actually, Heidi buys a, a powder probiotic that she adds to their water every day. Again, a suggestion from you. Right. So. Yeah. Same thing. I mean, I, it's just, you know, digest, just as health is really important oh. and the probiotics, just like people eating yogurt, it's mm-hmm. just a really good thing. Digest. I'm going to reinforce that statement. Digestive health is really important for your animals and for us. <laughs> really important to work yep. on that. Yeah. So let's jump on to chapter six, all about composting. And you have a section in here that's composting with chickens. Tell us about that. There's a couple different angles of composting with chickens. Obviously, when you clean your coop out, you know, Mm -hmm. you've got a bunch of manure, coop litter, whatever. When I do a good clean out in the fall before the winter, Mm -hmm. all of that compost goes right over my garden. And it it sits all winter. It decomposes. So in the spring, I can just turn it over. I've got, you know, beautiful, beautiful soil. Um, but people also forget about things like chicken feathers. Mm-hmm. I mean, they can add a lot of nutrients into the soil. Like when your chickens are molting, mm-hmm. if you rake your um, run out, throw all those chicken feathers in your garden. And also eggshells for plants that like calcium, like tomatoes, peppers, things like that. Crush up the eggshells and put them in the hole when you're yeah. uh, planting, planting your tomatoes. plant. tomatoes. Right? Yeah. Huge uh, calcium boost. So, yeah. you know, there's... Uh, chickens can really be be that's what i mean the, the gardening with the chickens it just it makes so much sense yeah when you kind of integrate it all together yeah. after our disaster with our hens last summer heidi got some new chickens i built the chicken coop or we built actually built the chicken coop together and we got chicks in october and one of the things that we noticed that the chicks were doing was they were eating the feathers that were coming off of them and at first we were kind of like, whoa, hold on here, time out. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that, that usually it's because they're, there's some kind of protein deficiency. Right. There's a lot of protein in chicken feathers, so mm-hmm. they are um, you know, looking for more protein. But with chicks, it's more probably a boredom thing. I mean, when you're uh, living in a plastic tote, you know, yeah. you kind of run out of things to do. <laughs> so. Right. And plus, baby chicks, they're kind of like baby, baby babies. You know, they'll put anything in their mouth that they can. Right. Um, I mean, it's not a terrible thing. You know, uh, I guess the protein is probably good for them. It's not really a habit you want to encourage. You know, if you see it in your older hens, you you probably want to up their protein a little bit. Right. Yeah, no, they've graduated from that. It's, yeah. just, it's just when they were, good. you know, two, three, four months old, they were, you know, doing that. It, was, it didn't seem to hurt them, so. Yeah. No, just, to, just, to, I mean, obviously you don't want your chickens plucking feathers out of each other, but, right. um, but yeah, bored chickens, uh, do tend to get in trouble. So mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> there you go. Give them, give them lots to do like swing, right? Do you, do you have a swing for your chicken? I do. Yeah, I do. They have a swing. They, they hop up onto it every once in a while. I mean, they'll really hop up on anything. You know, they've got a ladder, they've got outdoor perches and they're run, right. especially when it's muddy, they like to hop up onto stumps or logs or whatever. Yeah. Also in the composting chapter, you have a subchapter called chicken poop tea. How are you making that? Oh, yeah, that's really fun. Um, <laughs> if you just grab an old pillowcase and, uh, you know, take some of the chicken manure, if you have one of those, uh, I forget what they call them, like poop boards, or some people have like a little hammock under their roof oh, right, exactly. that kind of collects all the manure, something yep. like that. That's easy. Just pour it into the pillowcase, and then you just dunk it into a bucket of water. And just you want to like dunk it every day just to keep, you know, oxygen in the water and stuff. Mm-hmm. After, I don't know, two weeks or so, you've got this beautiful manure tea that really is a, is a super uh, liquid fertilizer. Oh, yeah. For your plant, I mean, you obviously don't want to spray it like on the plant leaves or on the produce you're going to be eating because it is manure, right. you know, but if you use it as a liquid fertilizer, like around the seedlings when you first um, mm-hmm. plant them, it can burn the leaves too because chicken manure is super, super so high in hot. nitrogen. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's super hot unless it aged. Oh, that and back to the regular manure, you don't want to add, you know, hot, <laughs> fresh chicken manure to your garden because it is, um, it can burn the, the plants. Right or the roots also it could have salmonella e coli things like that and so you do want to let it age which is why in the fall i put it on the garden because i'm not planting until spring right but you know aging in compost pile is is a good idea you don't want to just you know rake it out of your coop and toss it on your garden yeah yeah one of one of the things that i do here at the urban farm is i a couple times a year i will rake up all of the 
detritus from the chicken coop, so leftover grass clippings and leaves. Because what I, I've got my neighbors trained, they bring me their leaves every fall, so I have a a back nice. stock of yeah, exactly right. I was I was doing a jump mm-hmm. for joy this past year when two of my neighbors said, "Hey, can I bring you leaves?" It's like booyah. <laughs> so that gets spread in the chicken coop area, and I rake that up a couple of times a year, and that goes in the compost bin here because we don't get snow, thank God. So, right. you know, we grow all year round. So that's what, that's how I manage the, you know, the massive amount of chicken poo that we get from 19 hens. Right. So. Yeah. And if you do have the year round gardening, then you probably do want a compost pile so you can uh, make sure that it's aged enough. So one of the things that I've been experimenting with here at the Urban Farm, Lisa, is how to grow fodder or chicken food for our chickens so I'm not buying it. And you know, one of the things I suggested earlier that I was doing is starting to plant in the lawn. So when I do mow, you know, I'm getting some of it. What are other things that we can do to actually grow food on site for our chickens? Well, I love the idea of fodder, especially for those of us who do get snow and you don't have grass here around. I mean, you can sprout winter rye, wheat grass, pretty much any type of seed or grain or, you know, I've sprouted lentil, mung beans. You can either make sprouts, you know, just let them go till they sort of, I mean, everyone knows what sprouts are, right? Yeah. <laughs> you throw on your salad. Yeah. Um, you can sprout and give them the sprouts. It, it like super amps up the nutrients in that oh, seed yeah. or grain or bean or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or you can let it go as fodder and, you know, get, let it get three or four inches tall and actually kind of grow like sod mats for them. Uh, you know, I'll plant in those plastic containers that the garden centers put the, right. you know, the pots in. If you grow uh, in there, the fodder, it's, and basically fodder is you're, you're sprouting, you're doing it in the water, rinsing and all that without the dirt. So you've mm-hmm. just got the, the seeds and they basically grow into grass. So now you've got like this little sod mat. Once it's done, you just take it out of the plastic container and give it to the chickens. And it does give them basically green, fresh grass year round. Mm-hmm. So even for you when you're in their run, if you grow them this fodder, it does give them a lot of nutrition and it will cut down on feed costs. Yeah. hugely. I would not recommend like going to a low quality feed. I mean, I, I always say buy the best quality feed you can afford mm-hmm. and then supplement with a bunch of things because it really can cut your feed down, your feed cost down immensely yeah. if you do let them free range or if you do grow them fodder or sprouts for them yeah. or if you ferment their feed, you know, fermenting the feed really ramps up the probiotics and nutrients oh. so they'll eat less. How would one go yeah. about doing that? Well, basically, the the crumble or pellet doesn't it doesn't ferment terribly well. But if you have like a cracked grain feed or like scratch grain, uh-huh. you basically just soak them in water, and you're just basically letting them. Um, on my website, there's an article on fermenting feed. I don't think it's in my book, uh-huh. but yeah, basically, like you ferment anything, you're fermenting the grains, you know, for a couple of days, just three or four days, and they start to kind of get bubbly and yeasty, and yep. you know, something's going on there. You go to the chickens. I mean. They love it. And chickens are self-regulating. They won't eat. They won't overeat. So they'll only eat as much as they need to get the nutrients they need. So if you can up the nutrients in what you're feeding them, you're going to save money because they won't be eating as much. Yeah. Which is nice. Oh, big time. You know, you mentioned these flats and sprouts. Uh, I have a buddy here in town. And and once you said this, I I was reminded of this because when the chicks were small, we used to go to him and the, they do the sprouts and the, they cut them and they have these trays left over. So we were going in collecting these trays from them with, you know, partially growing plants in them in the soil. And the chicks just loved those. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, I like to, I do in little either tuna cans or catfish cans. I'll do like the fodder or the sprouts in mm-hmm. there for them. So they're like little, little mini chick sized fodder cakes, basically. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Any any last thoughts about your book? I mean, I personally think it's a, it's a really interesting book. <laughs> you know, whether you have chickens or don't, or yeah. garden or don't, I think it, it just is trying to give people ideas on how you can integrate them together because there, were, there really are huge benefits both for your garden and for your chickens. Mm-hmm. Without a lot of work, it's probably stuff you're already doing. It's just a question of integrating the chickens yeah. into what you're doing for the benefits. Yeah, that's the word I was going to use, integrating. So... Any <laughs> any final pieces of advice for our listeners? Oh, everybody should get chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and I didn't pay her to say that. 
<laughs> no, I, I do. I, but I think that chickens just make your life so much better. I mean, just the, the entertainment of watching them and the fresh eggs. and But beyond the fresh eggs, which is really what most people start raising the chickens for, there really are so many other benefits, whether it's bug control or, you know, helping sort of the fertilize the garden or whatever. Yeah. So I, I really think that, that people should consider it if they don't already raise them. It's, it's not hard. and You don't need a lot of land. Yay. Yay. And your first book was Fresh Eggs Daily, and that came out in 2013. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested, Correct. you can go back to episode number eight from the Urban Farm Podcast at urbanfarmpodcast.org, and you can listen to, listen to her about that book. And her new book came out in November, Gardening with Chickens, Plans and Plants, for You and Your Hens by Lisa Steele and, and published by Voyager Press. So thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Lisa. It's been a treat getting to chat with you. Thanks, Greg, and good luck with your new chickens and, and hopefully that bobcat will stay away. Uh, yeah, well, that bobcat ain't getting in. <laughs> that we <laughs> fixed, that we fixed. So how can our listeners find you? I have a website, fresheggsdaily.com, and I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Fresh Eggs Daily. And my books are on Amazon or, you know, check your local bookstore, your Barnes & Noble, whatever. Uh, you might find them there also. Perfect. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org, Gardening with Chickens. And we'll also have a, the, her list of books there. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWantToGarden.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.